Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to talk about blood pressure, but we're going to get into like a little intro. So we're going to talk about a couple different things throughout the process of this video. So what we're going to discuss is we're going to talk about systolic blood pressure. What is it? Okay. We're going to talk about diastolic blood pressure. We're going to talk about resistance. We're going to talk about flow. Okay. Specifically a different type of flow. All right. Like we kind of refer to it as like what's called the flow rate. Okay. With it, which is in the form of like centimeters cubed. Okay. Per minute. And then we're going to talk about the velocity of blood flow. Okay. We're going to talk about the cross sectional area of blood vessels. We're going to talk about the perfusion pressure and we're going to talk about Korakoff sounds. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. So first thing I want you guys to know is the reason why we're doing this little intro is because we're going to talk about what happens, the compensation mechanisms of what happens whenever your, your body has low blood pressure, how do you compensate for it? Whenever your body has high blood pressure, how does your body compensate for it? Knowing these terms and knowing exactly how they are influencing our overall systolic and diastolic blood pressure is extremely crucial. So let's go ahead and get started. So first off, how can we actually define blood pressure? Just in a general term, blood pressure is going to be equal to your cardiac output multiplied by your total peripheral resistance. Okay, now that we have this, we need to decipher what cardiac output is, what total peripheral resistance is. Because once we decipher these two things, then we can really get into this whole BP thing and understand exactly, exactly how our BP is fluctuating. First thing, let's talk about cardiac output. Okay, so let's discuss cardiac output. Let's talk about it over here. So first things first, cardiac output. How would you define cardiac output? Cardiac output, which we're referring to as CO, is actually equal to your heart rate multiplied by your stroke volume. Okay, so it's, it's the heart rate times your stroke volume. So what affects your heart rate? Well, your heart rate is actually going to be affected by many different things. We'll talk about this in the cardiac output video. But your heart rate could be affected by your parasympathetic nervous system by specifically slowing down the heart rate. It could be affected by your sympathetic nervous system, which will stimulate and increase the heart rate. It could be affected by hormones such as epinephrine and thyroid hormone. And these guys could actually stimulate it. It could even be affected by ions like uh, calcium, and potassium and sodium, and depending upon their levels, this could either increase or uh, and, uh, decrease the actual heart rate. So it all depends. The heart rate is dependent upon various different types of things. Another thing is the stroke volume, okay? And stroke volume is actually kind of broken up into three components here, okay? One component is called preload. So one component is called preload. The other one is called contractility, okay? And the last one is called afterload. So in a certain type of situation, the main thing that you're gonna to wanna to remember about preload, we'll talk about it in way more detail than this, but anytime you have an increase in your blood volume, okay? If you have more volume within the blood, okay? An increase in blood volume, this is going to increase what's called the end diastolic volume. And the end diastolic volume is referred to as the volume of blood that's within the heart before the ventricles pump, okay, and eject the blood. So it's like the pre-pumping volume. If this EDV increases, it increases the preload on your heart, which is basically the stretch. If your preload increases, that increases your stroke volume, okay? So that's one of the big things that we're gonna talk about throughout these actual blood pressure videos. Another thing, contractility. Contractility is dependent upon the sympathetic nervous system. This is going to increase the contractility, okay? Specifically through the presence of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So this would stimulate, and again, what are these two chemicals mainly? Epinephrine and norepinephrine. It also could be affected by hormones like glucagon and also from thyroxine. So even T3 and T4 and even glucagon, these guys have the ability to also increase contractility. And even ions, there's a lot of different things and even drugs too. But we're not gonna get into all the depths of this. One of the big ones that is actually gonna affect contractility is calcium. Either way, we say that whenever there's an increase in the contractility, there's an increase in the stroke volume, okay? And the last one is afterload. An afterload is referred to as like the resistance, the amount of pressure that you have to overcome to push blood from the ventricles into the actual, uh, specifically the actual arteries. 
So in this case, certain situations like hypertension, so if you have hypertension, this is actually going to increase the afterload. Another situation is atherosclerotic plaques. Atherosclerotic plaques. This is another way that this can happen. And also any type of basically like resistance, but specifically peripheral. So peripheral resistance. This can also increase the afterload. So if there's a lot of resistance from constriction of the capillary beds, this can increase the afterload, okay? And if you increase the afterload, this is actually going to decrease the stroke volume, okay? Now, let's make sure that we got this. Preload increases stroke volume. Increase in contractility increases stroke volume. But if there's an increase in afterload, there's gonna decrease the stroke volume. And the reason why is the more pressure that you have to overcome to push blood from the ventricles into the aorta is gonna be a lot higher. We'll talk about this in more detail in cardiac output, okay? Another way that I wanna talk about cardiac output besides this is, first off, how could we actually, like unit-wise, how could we actually calculate cardiac output? You know, cardiac output is, re is really in units of milliliters per minute. So it's in the form of milliliters per minute. So if this is in milliliters per minute, and then we also are gonna say that the heart rate Heart rate is actually gonna be in what's called beats per minute. And then stroke volume is going to be in milliliters per beat. What happens is beats cancel out and milliliters per minute is what you're left with. This is very, very similar to another formula, which is extremely important also. This formula is called flow, okay? So you know there's actually what's called flow and flow is basically defined as the volume of blood. You know, there's a, a chemistry equation, you know, one milliliter. One milliliter is actually equal to one centimeter cubed. So what I can say is, is that flow is actually in units of centimeters cubed per minute, which is milliliters per minute, which is pretty darn similar to cardiac output. There's a formula that can, we can actually relate with flow. You know what's called velocity? So velocity of the blood flow. So let's say that we have the velocity of the blood, okay? The speed at which the blood is actually moving, which is in centimeters squared per minute. This is equal to the flow, which is going to be in what unit? Centimeters cubed per minute over a special term, and this is going to be area, okay? Specifically, cross-sectional area of a blood vessel. So the cross-sectional area of the blood vessel, which is usually going to be in a specific unit, and this unit is actually going to be in centimeters squared per minute. Okay, I'm sorry, just centimeters squared. This should not be in minutes. There's no units for that. So it's just centimeters squared. Okay? So now we have this formula that velocity is equal to flow over area. Now, how can we actually relate this to the cardiac output formula? Okay, so let's get this thing right here first. We can say that the velocity of blood flow increases with increasing flow. What do we say flow is? Cardiac output. So if we can relate it like this, so what can we say about this? We can say that whenever there is an increase in your flow, which is basically the same thing as saying an increase in your cardiac output. What's gonna to happen to the velocity? There's gonna be an increase in the velocity of the blood. So we say that the velocity of the blood flow is increasing with increasing flow or specifically increasing cardiac output. What about the cross-sectional area? Well, the cross-sectional area is actually in the units of pi r squared, okay? Because blood vessels are usually like a, a cylinder shape. If the cross-sectional area increases, Okay, so the actual area, so imagine I have a blood vessel like this. Let's pretend right here, I'm gonna quiz you guys. Let's say here's a blood vessel. Let's say here's a blood vessel. And let's say here's a blood vessel. Which one of these has the total cross-sectional area? A, B, or C? A. Look at the distance, okay? Look at the whole distance from this edge of the blood vessel to this edge of the blood vessel. That has the greatest cross-sectional area, okay? So because of that, that's where we're gonna get this relationship, okay? So now let's look at this. We said the greater the cross-sectional area, what would this be? 
the velocity is going to decrease. So velocity will decrease. So let's look at it like this. Again, increase in the cross-sectional area, I'm just going to put A here for area, you're going to have area there, is going to do what to the velocity? It's going to decrease the velocity of blood flow. So now, how does this relate? How does, how does this area thing, this increase in the area, cross-sectional area, decrease velocity? Just think about it simply. I like to apply, let's say that I have here a really big hole and then just a small hole, all right? Imagine five liters of blood <laughs> trying to flow through this bad boy and amount five liters of blood trying to flow through this bad boy, okay? Another way to just simply think about it is, let's say I have a hose, okay, I have a hose. Water's coming out the hose, right? I turn the water on, the water's coming out the hose at a, at a nice pace. But then I take and I put my thumb over the edge of the hose, okay? And I, I occlude some of the actual, the, the, the area, that hole. And I make the diameter, or the cross-sectional area in this case, a lot smaller. What's going to happen to the flow of water? It's going to start shooting out. That means that the velocity increased. So when I decrease the diameter, right, of this blood vessel, or I decrease the cross-sectional area, it increases the velocity of the blood flow. You know how this is relating? Let's come over here to the graph for a second, because this is why it has such a relationship, and it's very important to talk about it. If you look at these guys in order. So let's say that we talk about first off aorta, its cross-sectional area, arteries, cross-sectional area, arterioles, cross-sectional area, capillaries, cross-sectional area, venules, and veins. I'm gonna kind of like maybe, I might blow your minds a little bit here. Let's say that I start here and I talk about the cross-sectional area for the aorta. Believe it or not, the cross-sectional area for the aorta is gonna be very, very small. And then as you start moving towards the arterioles and the capillaries, it's gonna start rising. And as you get towards the venules, it starts decreasing again and comes back down. So what have we noticed so far about this curve? I've noticed that my aorta and my arteries, and let's say, actually say the arteries don't change much. They change just a little bit here. But once you hit arterioles, that's when the actual, specifically the cross-sectional area increases. You might be like, but dude, Zach, I remember the, on blood vessel characteristics, you said that the aorta had a really big diameter. It does. But look at it like this. We're going to take and we're com going to compare each one of these guys, aorta, art arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and I want to discuss the cross-sectional area just a little bit more so it's not confusing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these numbers and these numbers are going to correlate okay, with what we're going to talk about down here. Let's come down here to this vascular network. So first off, this big one here, we're going to consider this to be one, which is the aorta. Then the aorta splits, it gives off arteries, so we're going to say this is two. Then it's going to give off arterial branches, one, two, three arterial branches. Then it's going to give off capillary branches, many, many different capillary branches, like 10 to 100 per capillary bed. Then after they drain from the capillary beds, they go into what's called venules. Then from the venules, one, two, three venules, they come eventually into the veins. And again, this can actually return to the caval system, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. Okay? Look at the cross-sectional area as we go along this entire course. Okay, watch this. If I do this in like this purple here, let's compare this cross-sectional area right here to here versus this cross-sectional area from here to here, okay? Kind of like from there to there. If you notice this cross-sectional area, and again, I'm taking this blood vessel and this blood vessel because I'm actually taking their entire cross-sectional area from this whole artery to this artery. This guy's cross-sectional area is not very big. Okay, as compared to this guy, the arterioles, the combined effect of all of the cross-sectional areas of all the arterioles in this area. Okay, so this guy has a low cross-sectional area. This one has a decent cross-sectional area as compared to this one. Oh, but look here, we get into the arterioles. And these arterioles, they branch all the way down. And not just here, but remember, this guy's gonna go and branch. This guy, if we actually followed him for just a brief second here, remember this arterial is gonna give off this artery is going to give off many different arterioles. So really, if I were to be very specific, this guy would move all the way from here all the way to here. Holy sweet goodness. That's a heck of a cross-sectional area. So now this guy's got a really big cross-sectional area. But then, let's kick it up another notch. Let's say that I actually have these guys, they break into many, many different capillaries, right? So these guys break up into a whole bunch of different capillary network. So now look at this guy's cross-sectional area. It's going to be yay big from here all 
the way down to here. This guy's got an even bigger cross-sectional area if you take that into consideration. Then if you go into the vanules, you're going to get the same thing. And if we go from here, the vanules are going to come all the way down here. So this would come from here all the way down to here. And this is going to have a pretty big cross-sectional area also. And you get the point. As we keep going down, there will also be a venous network over here that will drain into this one. So it might go from here to about right here, we'll say. Okay? This one also has a pretty big cross-sectional area. What's the whole point I'm trying to get to you? Two big things here. One is the cross-sectional area of the capillaries and comparing the cross-sectional area of the aorta. Okay? Some people just may, might not get it right away because they think, oh, the aorta, big diameter. That's true. And they think capillary, oh, that's a small diameter. But you're not taking the, the diameter of, of one capillary. You're taking the diameter of the entire capillary network, a cross-section of it and you're squishing all of those together. All right, so now that we got the cross-sectional area down, that's important because again, aorta and capillaries, sometimes that just confuses people because they think about the diameter. You gotta think about the total cross-section of those entire vessels. Okay, so now because of that, what was the relationship between velocity and cross-sectional area? They were inverse. So, if you think about this then, how would the velocity look? Well, this guy has the lowest cross-sectional area, so he would have the highest velocity. So in other words, let's say I start it up here. My velocity is going to start up really high, and then it's going to start steadily decreasing, and then eventually it'll come back up a little bit and go to like that point there. Okay? So what are you noticing then? From this graph, we're able to see that as you increase the cross-sectional area, what happens to the velocity of the blood flow? It decreases. Okay? That's the relationship. So now what can we say? We can say that the velocity of blood flow is highest in the aorta. And the velocity of blood flow is slowest within the capillaries. Why is that so important? Because a slow flow allows for what? It allows for good capillary exchange you want to have good capillary exchange there. If the capillary exchange is really, really fast, are you gonna be able to diffuse a lot of oxygen and nutrients and different types of substances into the tissue area? No, because you're not gonna have enough time. So you want there to be a nice slow flow for a good capillary exchange. Okay, so I think we uh, killed that there, nice. Let's move on to the next thing. So we talked about cardiac output in, in a pretty good detail there. Okay, we're comparing heart rate, stroke volume, flow, velocity, and cross-sectional area. Now let's go into what's called total peripheral resistance, okay? Total peripheral resistance is a very, very important topic, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about this guy. All right, so first off, how do I calculate resistance? Well, there's two formulas. One is I could say, I could actually compare resistance to flow. I could actually say that flow is equal to the change in pressure over the resistance. What is another way of rewriting this formula? What did I say flow is? Flow is equal to, technically, cardiac output. So let me replace here cardiac output is equal to the change in pressure, which is actually basically our blood pressure in this case, over the resistance, which I'm going to rewrite in this case as total peripheral resistance. Doesn't it just look like that formula right up there? Just rearrange? That's all it is. So this is one of the ways that we could express total peripheral resistance. But even better, there's another way that we can actually define resistance. Resistance is equal to 8 n l over pi r4. This is called Poiseuille's equation. Okay, I'm not even going to try to spell it. Okay, Poiseuille's equation. Poiseuille's equation basically gives us how these three important factors influence resistance. So there's three factors that influence resistance. One is going to be n. What does n stand for? n stands for viscosity. Okay, N stands for viscosity. The next one is going to be L. L stands for the length of the blood vessel. And then the last one is going to be R, which is going to be radius. And radius is really, really, really important. Out of all of these, the most important contributor to resistance is going to be the radius of the blood vessel. Okay, so how are these relating? Well, look at them directly. Viscosity is right here. If I increase viscosity, what's going to happen to the resistance? It increases. Same thing, if I increase the length, what happens to the resistance? It increases. If I increase the radius, though, since this is on the bottom, it increases the denominator. That makes the resistance less. 
So this would decrease the resistance. So we can say that viscosity is directly proportional to the resistance. We can say that length is directly proportional to the resistance. But we say that radius is inversely proportional to the resistance. Viscosity. Let's actually take viscosity and say, what are, the, what are some things that actually could change it? Let's say that we actually, because we apply this to, to uh, phys you know, physiological correlations, right? So let's say here that I take my viscosity and I increase the viscosity or I decrease the viscosity. What could be things that could actually do this? Well, let's say that I have a lot of red blood cells. Okay, so it's called polycythemia. So polycythemia is when you have an elevated hematocrit, a lot of red blood cells. So basically a lot of red blood cells. You have an elevated hematocrit, you have a lot of red blood cells, there's gonna be a lot of friction, okay, between the layers. Because whenever blood is flowing, it actually flows in layers. When there's a lot of friction rubbing up against between those layers, it's gonna increase, it's because of the increase in viscosity. So increased viscosity is gonna have more friction between the layers that are flowing through the blood vessel, which is gonna increase the resistance. Okay, it's gonna slow down the blood flow in this case, right? So that could be one reason. Another cause could actually be dehydration. Because you know in dehydration, you lose a lot of your, uh, in certain situations, like if you're severely dehydrated, you lose a lot of fluid volume. So your blood volume decreases. When your blood volume decreases, this causes your, your blood to actually become very concentrated with red blood cells. It produces what's called hemoconcentration. Okay, it produces what's called hemoconcentration. It's a very weird thing where you actually can have an elevated hematocrit whenever you're dehydrated, okay, because of the hemoconcentration. Another thing, what about in certain situations whenever your viscosity is really low? Where your viscosity could actually decrease in anemia. Just think the exact opposite. So what if you have anemia? If you have severe anemia, you're gonna have a low hematocrit. That means that there's gonna be less, less friction between the layers of the blood. Less friction means less resistance, okay? So decreased amount of RBCs, okay? So just giving some examples of how this could be relatable. What about length? Length doesn't have a significant amount, but really, we just say it again. In this situation, we're not even gonna really comply, uh, compare two different types because it, there isn't really significant types of differences here. Really, we just say that if, let's say that length increases, okay? So let's say that the length of the blood vessel increases. What could be a cause of length increasing? Really, it's dependent upon the actual weight. So, for example, if somebody is very heavy, if they have a very high weight, right? They're gonna have to, their blood vessels are gonna have to be a little bit longer, okay? So an increased body weight means increased length of the blood vessels. Increased length of the blood vessels increases your resistance, okay? That's one example. And obviously, if you wanna say for this, decrease in the length could actually be a decrease in the body weight, okay? A decrease in the body weight. Also, the height of the individual also plays a difference. So not just weight, but also height. So height also plays a difference a little bit. Okay. Now, for the most important is the radius. Okay. For the most important is going to be the radius. The radius is so important. And the reason why is, let's say that we take, for example, the two different types of scenarios here, right? We take whenever the radius is really, really you, you increase the radius, okay? Or we talk about what happens whenever you decrease the radius, okay? What would happen when you increase the radius? In the body, this is called vasodilation, okay? And that's when your smooth muscle cells relax. And then what happens is the diameter of the blood vessel gets bigger. So the diameter of the blood vessel increases because the actual blood vessel is relaxing, okay? In the other situation, whenever your actual radius is decreasing, this is referred to as vasoconstriction. And in vasoconstriction, the actual blood vessel diameter is actually decreasing. So the diameter of the blood vessel, or the radius of the blood vessel in this case, is decreasing. This is due to increased sympathetic nervous system activity. So whenever your sympathetic nervous system is really, really active, it's gonna cause this constriction of the blood vessels, which decreases the resistance. Okay, and if you decrease, I'm sorry, if you decrease the radius, you decrease the radius, you're going to increase the resistance. 
The other one is vasodilation. This is due to very, very low or pretty much absent sympathetic nervous system activity. If this decreases, less sympathetic nervous system innervation comes, the blood vessels will start, uh, muscle, the muscle will actually start relaxing, the blood vessel will dilate, the diameter increases, the radius increases, and the resistance decreases. Okay. And the reason why radius is so much more of the significant one is, is look at the power. It's raised to the fourth power. If that's raised to the fourth power, imagine how much of a difference this could make. And so again, because this radius is raised to the fourth power, that is why it is the most significant factor and the factors that can influence resistance, okay? All right, so that covers that part of resistance. Now. What I want to talk about is I want to talk about a, a term, another, going on with this flow. Because flow, we can actually combine into two different types of flow within the blood. Okay, whenever blood is actually flowing through a circulation, there's what's called laminar flow. So th this is basically your normal flow. It's like a streamlining flow or just basically your normal flow. And the way you can think about laminar flow is, oh, let's actually kind of look at it like this. Let's say I have a blood vessel here and I have the actual, the layers of the blood is moving, and what you're gonna notice is that as you go towards the edge, okay, as you go towards the edges, the velocity of the blood is actually gonna be slower, okay? So the blood, the velocity towards the edges is slower, and the velocity of the blood towards the, uh, in the middle is the highest. That's why whenever you look at this, they kind of look at it in a concentric way. So imagine you're looking at the blood vessel as like a circle and you're looking at the flow from the back. You're gonna notice that this flow is very concentric. Okay, this flow is a concentric flow. And again, where is the velocity the highest? The velocity of the blood flow is going to be the highest in the center, whereas the velocity of the blood flow is going to be the lowest at the edges, okay? So they call this type of flow the streamline flow, laminar flow, okay? This type of flow is silent, and it really doesn't have, whenever our blood is actually flowing through the actual, uh, our circulation, right, throughout our blood vessels, it, laminar flow really doesn't have any type of effect on our resistance, and the reason why is, if you look at the graph here for laminar flow, as you increase the pressure, your flow increases proportionally. So it's a linear relationship. So this perfusion pressure, this delta P, okay, which really, when we talk about the delta P, delta P is really referring to uh, your mean arterial pressure minus what's called your central venous pressure. We'll talk about that very briefly, okay? But what's happening is, as you increase the pressure, it's increasing the flow, okay? All right, so that's that. Next one I wanna talk about, it's what's called turbulent flow. This one is, kind of the pathological one. This is the one that gives the problems that you can kind of, you can actually hear. So for example, let's say that I take a blood vessel here, and I am going to kind of freck this guy up and I'm gonna give him a atherosclerotic plaques, okay? So I'm gonna give him a nice little plaque development here. So look, he has a nice little plaque development right here that's accumulating because of, uh, you know, cholesterol is accumulating in here and it has a nice little uh, atheroma here. Because of this, what's gonna happen to the blood flow? Okay, well, what's the normal type of blood flow in general? Generally, let's say before the occlusion, it's a nice streamline flow, right? And this is called laminar flow. What happens is, as this gets to this occlusion, these right here starts actually developing, when it hits this occlusion, it starts developing a nice like type of turbulency. It literally is just like ruckus in there, okay? So whenever there is some type of occlusion within the blood vessel, there's a lot of turbulence, which gives off a lot of heat, okay? And gives off, so it gives off a lot of heat and it changes the actual perfusion pressure. What do I mean? So let's look at the graph here. With turbulent flow, if I take the graph here, let's say that here's my normal graph. Let's say that there was laminar flow originally, okay? So as you increase pressure, you inc you, as you increase the pressure, your flow is increasing. But now, I'm gonna take this abnormal one. So look, here let's say that the turbulent flow is gonna be, it's moving up straight here, but we get to this point right here where it actually veers off. And the flow starts decreasing as the perfusion pressure starts increasing. So what do you notice about turbulent flow? 
Two things. If there's turbulent flow, it decreases the actual flow, the volume of blood that is circulating through a, an area of a blood vessel every one minute. And it's gonna increase the perfusion pressure. What does that mean then? Oh, look at this. Come here. Resistance, right? If we look at this with respect to resistance, let's, well, let's rearrange the formula. Resistance is equal to delta P over F. I decrease the flow and increase the perfusion pressure. That means that this number goes up and this number goes down. The resistance then is going to go up. You're going to have a very high resistance. So what do we know about turbulent flow then? Because of the math, what do we do? It decreased the flow and it increased the pressure, the perfusion pressure. Because of that, the resistance is going to increase. So out of this, you're going to notice that the path of this is going to be high resistance. This is for the turbulent. And this one right here, where the flow and the pressure are going to be moving in a linear relationship, this is very low resistance. So in certain situations like turbulent flow, this could be pathological or physiological. You know there's an actual physiological example of turbulent flow? You know how inside of our heart we have the valves? Let's say that here is your actual, let's say this is your aorta for a second right here. And here's the aortic semilunar valve and the mitral valve. Whenever blood is being pumped upwards, right, it can hit that valve. It can hit the mitral valve. As it hits the mitral valve, it might develop some turbulent flow. Okay? That's a physiological example. But this type of example in which there is actually some type of plaque or some type of restriction, okay, whatever it might be, some type of plaque, this is going to be a pathological cause. It releases a lot of heat. It increases the perfusion pressure. It increases the resistance. It decreases the flow. How would you be able to identify this? This can produce what's called brutes, which can be heard on the carotid artery. So if you actually take the stethoscope and put it over the carotid artery, you can actually hear these, these actual sounds because of the turbulent flow. It's called brutes. Another one it can, is going to actually produce murmurs. So it can actually can produce pathological murmurs too. Okay, so that's the relationship of turbulent flow and laminar flow. Now, last thing I want to talk about. Okay, what have we covered throughout the process of this video? We've talked about cross-sectional area. We talked about velocity to blood flow. We talked about flow. We talked about resistance. And we're going to talk this last, we also talked a little bit about perfusion pressure. We'll talk about it in here now in just a little bit more detail. Perfusion pressure is what we said to be equal to. It's the change in P that we talked about. This is equal to the mean arterial pressure minus the central venous pressure. Now, the central venous pressure is really, when we look at it, it really determines what's called our right atrial pressure. This is the pressure that whenever you're trying to bring blood to the right side of the heart, so for example, let's say that I have a small mini diagram here. Let's say here's your right side of the heart here, right? And here's your vena cava system. The pressure that's trying to bring blood towards the heart is the central venous pressure. So the central venous pressure affects the right atrial pressure, okay? But really, in certain situations, this is so small. It can be about three to eight millimeters of mercury, but it's usually so small that we don't even consider it often. Really, most of the time, we say that the actual perfusion pressure is the mean arterial pressure. This is what we usually refer to it as. Now the question is, what the heck is mean arterial pressure? Before we talk about mean arterial pressure, we have to discuss the systolic and diastolic. So what is systolic blood pressure and what is diastolic blood pressure? Let's have another mini diagram here. Let's say I take the actual left ventricle and left atrium here. Okay, and let's say here's my aorta. Okay, and here's my aortic semilunar valve. Whenever the heart contracts, okay, whenever the heart is contracting, it's pumping blood out of the heart. Okay, so let's say that here we have the blood, right? and we're trying to push the blood out of the heart. The force at which we're trying to push the blood out of the heart and into the arteries is the systolic blood pressure. That's the force that the heart is trying to generate to push blood out of the ventricles and into the actual major arteries. If it's primarily, when we talk about this, the left ventricle though, and it's pumping it into the aorta, this pressure by which it pushes it into the actual aorta to snap open the aortic semilunar valves and fill up the aorta, that systolic blood pressure is, is actually going to be approximately 120 millimeters of mercury on average. So an average human being, it should be around 120. That's an average. Now, what happens is, whenever this blood comes into the aorta, it stretches the walls of the aorta. 
So now the walls of the aorta is going to be stretched. Now this is not an aneurysm, okay? We're not drawing an aneurysm, I know it looks like it is, but I'm just giving you an example here. That as the blood starts actually coming out into this area and filling up the aorta, it starts compressing on the walls, stretching the walls. That stretching of the walls is the systolic blood pressure. But what happens is, eventually, the actual aorta is very elastic. So eventually, when it's elastic, what happens with elasticity? It wants to recoil. It wants the blood vessel to assume the smallest size possible. When it recoils and snaps back, it squeezes the blood downwards, okay? So it's gonna send it out through the aorta and then down, eventually it could either send it up to the head, it could send it up to the neck, or it could send it down through the, the abdominal and thoracic aorta, right? Whenever the aorta is coming back to its natural size, so the point in which it actually is relaxing and going back to its normal original size, that part of which it hits its normal original size is called the diastolic blood pressure. So again, whenever the blood is coming out and being pushed into the aorta and stretching the aorta, that's the systolic blood pressure, normally 120, the aorta recoils and propels the blood outwards to the different peripheral tissues. When it recoils completely and comes back to its normal shape and its normal original size, that pressure that is occupied in that area is the diastolic blood pressure, which is normally about 80 millimeters of mercury in a natural, you know, ordinary human being. Now that we know this, this mean arterial pressure, how do we calculate it? Okay, so what we do is we take the diastolic blood pressure, which was about what? 80 millimeters of mercury. Then what we do is, is we're going to add it to what's called the pulse pressure. What is the pulse pressure? The pulse pressure is the difference between these two pressures. So if I take 120 millimeters of mercury minus 80 millimeters of mercury, this gives me what's called the pulse pressure. And what is the pulse pressure equal to? 120 minus 80, I can do that math, 40 millimeters of mercury, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the 80 millimeters of mercury, which is the diastolic blood pressure, and I'm gonna add it to one third of the pulse pressure. So I'm gonna add this to one third of 40 millimeters of mercury. This comes out to about uh, 13. So if I take here mean arterial pressure is equal to 80 millimeters of mercury plus 13 millimeters of mercury, about. This gives me a mean arterial pressure of 93 millimeters of mercury. That is our mean arterial pressure. So the mean arterial pressure we got is 93 millimeters of mercury. This pressure is important because this pressure is what determines the actual pressure by which you'll propel substances out of the uh, capillary beds into the tissues, okay? This mean arterial pressure is very important. We talked about this in the microcirculation video, how it's regulated within the central nervous system and other different tissues within the body. So very, very important. You wanna keep a mean arterial pressure very, very stable around approximately 93 millimeters of mercury. Last thing I wanna talk about is whenever you're doing what's called vital signs, Okay, you're talking, to, you're doing vital signs. You're checking the person's respiration rate, you're checking their pulse, you're checking their blood pressure, you're doing other different types of things like their pulse ox and their temperature, all that different things. When you're doing that, you're doing this, let's say that you're actually measuring their blood pressure. All right, so you put the blood pressure cuff on. You start pumping up the actual, uh, the, the blood pressure cuff. As you start pumping up the blood pressure cuff, usually you put it around the brachial area. So you're compressing the brachial artery. As you compress the brachial artery, you're kind of uh, decreasing and slowing the blood flow through that area. So you keep pumping it until you hear no sounds. Or do, like, you know, go to a decently high uh, pressure, like to hit it like 200 millimeters of mercury. Then you start slowly letting go. As you start slowly letting go, you're gonna hear like tapping sounds and then some like swishing sounds. Those tapping and swishing sounds that are coming out are your core cough sounds. Okay, that's what we're hearing. The first sound that you're gonna hear like da-dum, da-dum, that is the systolic blood pressure. So again, you're pumping up the blood pressure cuff, compressing the brachial artery, decreasing the blood flow through that area. Once you get it to a decently high point and you start letting go of it, you're gonna hear, start hearing tapping and swishing sounds. Those sounds are the core cough sounds. After those sounds go away, it leads into the systolic blood pressure, which is gonna, you're gonna hear as da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Those sounds are gonna continue and continue and continue until the sounds completely dissipate or disappear. So you don't hear those sounds anymore. So once the da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, and it's gone, that last point at which the sounds disappear is called the diastolic blood pressure. 
Okay, so core cough sounds is those little tapping and swishing sounds that you hear whenever you're applying the blood pressure cuff and you're pumping it up and you start letting go of it, you hear those tapping and swishing sounds. The first sound that you hear, like da dun, that's systolic blood pressure. Whenever you don't hear the sounds, the last point in which the sounds disappear and dissipate is the diastolic blood pressure. Now, engineers, we covered a lot of information in this video and I really hope it helped. I hope it makes sense. I truly do. I want this stuff to make sense because it's going to make a really, really big difference in the blood pressure regulation video. If you guys like this video, if you guys enjoyed it, if it helped, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. As always, engineers, until next time.